Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. As I've uh, commented on Wilms Front uh, previously, uh, we've we've seen well we've seen lockdown restrictions uh, around uh, Australia begin to be uh, relaxed. Our civil liberties have continued to be uh, suspended during the coronavirus pandemic. However, our democratic voting rights uh, have uh, remained intact. Uh, just as the coronavirus infection curve was on the rise in late March, the Electoral Commission of Queensland, the ECQ, still proceeded uh, with uh, compulsory uh, uh, attendance voting for Queensland local government elections. Uh, no community transmissions were traced to Queensland polling booths, so the elections were able to uh, t uh, take place and all the votes uh, counted and uh, winners declared. Meanwhile, over in the United Kingdom, for example, they've suspended uh, their uh, democratic uh, elections, local government elections until 2021. With the inc infection curve now flat, uh, there is no doubt uh, that uh, Queensland's first uh, fixed date election will proceed on Saturday, October 31st this year under new fixed four-year term provisions. The election is shaping up to be one of the most critical elections for the future direction of the state. The Anastasia Palaszczuk-led Labor government is seeking a third term, both both of its election victories. It only just scraped over the line into government. Despite the Liberal National Party of Queensland winning 23 of the 30 Queensland House of Representatives uh, seats at last year's May 18 federal election, which uh, we've just passed the one year anniversary, which helped Scott Morrison win majority government. The state election, the current two party preferred polling is 50 50. Opposition leader Deb Frecklington, she's been in the job since the LNP's 2017 state election defeat. Some say with all of the scandals and waste of the, the Palaszczuk government, Frecklington should be in the box seat for the election, but that's not the case. Queensland is a uh, diverse uh, state demographically and electorally. Uh, Brisbane has become a Labour heartland, uh, with the exception of the city of Brisbane itself. Uh, the Golden Sunshine Coast, a uh, safe LNP ter territory, and central and north Queensland, they uh, always shape up to be multi-party contests with uh, One Nation and the, the Cata Party uh, in the mix there. Queensland politics garners uh, much more national attention and analysis, uh, in part due to the high media profiles now of uh, Queensland journalists uh, Peter Gleeson and Renee v Villaris on Sky News and in the Courier Mail to provide a comprehensive uh, pre-election uh, uh, analysis of the uh, Queensland political uh, landscape. Uh, my sole featured guest on this week's Wilms Front is one of the, uh, the state's uh, top uh, political anal analyst uh, Graham Young. Uh, he is the publisher of Online Opinion, an independent uh, e-journal uh, of Australia and, and uh, political and social debate. He is also the executive director of the Australian Institute for Progress, a Brisbane-based uh, free market policy think tank. He's been in the thick of Queensland politics in the past as a member of the state Liberal Party uh, before it merged uh, with the, the LNP. Graham, welcome, welcome back to well, welcome to to Wilms Front, uh, but welcome, uh, <laughs> welcome back on uh, an unshackled production. It's great to be back. Uh, because I'll I'll just uh, recrop your uh, uh, your your picture picture there because you you changed the the the, the frame when I, <laughs> I did. Sorry, I, we're we're always improving on things up here in Queensland. Well, I remember the uh, the last time uh, it was a it was a pre-recorded during the twenty seventeen uh, uh, before the twenty seventeen Queensland state election. Uh, I can't believe a whole electoral cycle has has passed us. It's it's been a while, although not a lot's actually changed up here. The government's uh, pulled a few swifties to try and keep itself in power, but in terms of policy. It's hard to see the difference um, since Campbell Newman left, in fact. And Campbell Newman, uh, in my uh, pre-research uh, for the show, I noticed he's on your Australian Institute for Progress Board of Directors now. Campbell is, yeah. It, um, 
I, I worked with him occasionally in the past. You, know, you said that I was involved with the Liberal Party um, before it merged with the LNP. In fact, the last time that I held any sort of office in the Liberal Party was um, 23 years ago now, so um, it's almost ancient history. But I do do polling, and in my role as a pollster, I worked with Campbell the first time that he got elected to uh, the City Council. Um, so I guess most of you, your listeners realise that Campbell was Lord Mayor of Brisbane um, before he was then uh, catapulted. I was going to say parachuted, but there was nothing soft about the way he came down, catapulted into state parliament. So that first election, uh, Campbell really didn't get a lot of support from the Liberal Party itself, but a number of us um, who'd been instrumental in a few election wins in the 90s got pulled in to help. So I did his polling in that uh, election and uh, I've had a social relationship with him since, but it wasn't really until the last couple of years when we launched his biography um, that uh, I've had a lot more to do with Campbell. And the thing that you start to appreciate is how much energy and drive Campbell brought to the Liberal Party. Um, and uh, I think it's sorely lacking that energy and drive uh, now that he's gone. It's a bit like the, the Energizer Bunny ads. Take that battery out and Campbell was the battery and the whole thing goes back into uh, slow motion. It's it's so in the past now the 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 uh, Bajocki Peterson uh, era the 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 National uh, Party sometimes in coalition with the the Liberal Party in that state thirty two years in power from nineteen fifty seven to nineteen eighty nine but in the thirty one years since it's been four uh, roughly four and a half years of uh, either the the uh, liberal uh, and nationals in coalition or now the uh, liberal national party of queensland in in government it's uh, wayne goss uh, peter Beatty, and now anastasia palaszczuk have have been the uh, the, the longest uh, serving uh, premiers during that time yeah the uh it's been frustrating. So the uh, the first time they won in uh, 95 slash 96, because they didn't win the general election, they were a couple of seats short. Uh, we disputed the return in Mundingburra and we were successful in getting a re-election run there. And we won that, which then put Liz Cunningham, who was the independent member for Cunningham, uh, for Gladstone rather, into the box seat. And she chose the Liberal National Coalition or the National Liberal Coalition, I should probably say, uh, because we won more uh, votes than the Labor Party did. So that was a minority government. I did a fair bit of the strategy, in fact, most of the strategy for that election. Um, and um, uh, then two and a half years later, they were out of power. And, and one of the reasons they were out of power was because that was the rise of One Nation. So it was a 98 election. And um, they couldn't handle... Uh, the question of Pauline Hanson. The Liberal Party went out early and said that as a matter of principle, they would give One Nation uh, second preferences. And that was not popular in Brisbane. It was not a smart move. Uh, it was not a smart move to put the spotlight on the question of preferences. And unfortunately, because they put it there back in 1998, it's never really moved since. And um, one of the reasons that the party did poorly at the last election was because um, Tim Nichols, who was then the leader, didn't have a good good answer to how they were going to deal with One Nation. Um, so they blew up that first time for reasons of One Nation. They blew up the second time, um, I think, because and, and they only just lost uh, under uh, Campbell Newman. And I think the reason that they lost was that they didn't handle the fact that he was a difficult person well. They never went out and said to the people of Queensland, look, we know you don't like Campbell. We can understand you don't like Campbell. We find him difficult too, but he gets things done. And remember what it was like under the previous people. They never never did that pitch. He fell short by uh, um, a seat or so. And we got the, uh, the government of Anastasia Palaszczuk. The Liberals have, and the LNP rather have never managed to, to claw back from that. 
Uh, they, they sort of needed to sell him as a, as a tough bastard that you may, you may not like him, but he's, he's fixing the state. And he was compared at the time uh, with the, uh, uh, with the, because he, uh, Tim Nichols was the, the treasurer at the time uh, because, well, the budget, state budget is still a, a mess at the moment. Uh, state debt is projected to top 90 uh, billion. Uh, he started to undertake uh, that uh, slashing the the public sector, which is has grown uh, again, and he also uh, uh, stuck it to the, the the local arts community as well with the cancelling the premier's lit literacy uh, awards, and he was compared to uh, Jeff Kennett here in Victoria uh, during the the nineties, uh, but uh, Jeff Kennett got a bit more time to uh, to implement. Uh, and this isn't a dirty word, uh, radical uh, reforms, which uh, uh, made it easier for sort of our uh, do-nothing Labor government under Braxton Brumby for 11 years. Yeah, look, I think one of Campbell's problems was that Jeff was one of his close advisors. Don't know how many people know that, but uh, he used to speak to him very frequently. And, you know, in politics, you've actually got to take circumstances as you find them and you just can't take a model from somewhere else another time and another place and impose it and that's to a certain extent what happened in Queensland. So you're from Victoria, you would recall that before Jeff Kennett the state was basically broken, everyone knew it was, you had financial institutions falling over, there were real problems. So Jeff had been regarded as a joke a lot of the time when he was opposition leader and it was only this collapse under um, John Cain which allowed him to come in and then take these measures because people said, look, we're not comfortable with what he's doing, but we realise this is an emergency. We've got to do something about it. We didn't have that situation in Queensland. No one thought that the state government was broke. Campbell hadn't really run on economic issues. There was a lot of anger with Anna Bly. And, and the reason for the anger was before the election that she won, she'd said that they wouldn't privatise anything. They win the election and then suddenly, I think it was $8 billion worth of privatisation happened. People were not happy with that. They felt like they'd been lied to. Um, you'd had a long period of Labor government too by that stage. So they were ready for a, for a change. Campbell came along, Mr Energy, um, he managed to, to win the election. But he didn't win the election on the basis of we have an economic emergency here. So when he then had um, Peter Costello and uh, I think it was Amanda Vanstone uh, who did a, uh, <coughs> pardon me, a uh, uh, study on, into Queensland what we ought to do and they came up with these proposals, people said, hang on, we didn't know there was a problem. So it's a classic case of coming along and saying, hey, here's a solution and people saying, we don't need a solution. We don't need to take that tablet, we're not sick. So that was a large part of Campbell's problem. Um, saying that he was going to sack those public servants, that was another issue. Uh, at the same time as he was sacking those public servants and getting a lot of flack for it, a lot of the local governments, including Brisbane, but some of the surrounding local governments were also paring back on their public servants. They didn't go out there and say, we're going to pare back the public service. They just did it. They did it um, organically by people retiring, by reorganising things, people leaving, moving on. They got similar reductions to what Campbell did, but Campbell just wasn't smart in the way he went, went about it. So there were those sorts of issues here that means you can't compare Queensland to Victoria. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that there, uh, to justify radical reforms and, and cutbacks, you basically have to be on the verge of of bankruptcy. And I remember at the uh, at the time when when Campbell was was in, was introducing these cutback cutbacks, that's when the the first Abbott hockey budget fell completely flat. With the the most memorable aspect of it, the the copay and. The Australian people just didn't feel they were in a in a budget emergency then. No, well, you know, uh, Tony used the small target strategy to a certain extent, and the small small target strategy is keep the focus on your opponent. It's not have no policies, but it's keep the focus on your opponent. And the issue that he ran on was the carbon tax more than anything else, um, and the series of disasters that you'd seen on on the Labor side. But they basically accepted 
a lot of the labor agenda. So, you know, we got stuck with the uh, uh, increase in costs from the NDIS when it really should have been looked at uh, much more uh, closely and increases in education and health and so on, which again, arguably he shouldn't have done, but he committed to doing that. And then when he got into power, he tried to pull it back and that's where he got into trouble. Even though at the end of the day, the Senate didn't let him cut it back. So if you look at spending under every year of Tony Abbott and every year since, there's been an increase in health spending. There's been an increase in education spending. Every election, the Labor Party has run on the basis of the Liberals cuts to services. It's been a lie, mm -hmm. but Tony created the impression that that's what was going to happen, even though the facts belie that impression. Um, so yeah, um, you really, if you're going to, to win elections, you want to make sure you set yourself up so that you're not seen to be betraying the trust that people put in you when they elected you. So if you're going to change course, you need to have <clears throat> some sort of a um, um, process that gets people to understand that this is necessary. And if we don't do this, something bad will happen to us, which is one of the um, interesting sidelights, I guess, of the, the COVID situation, because a lot of people are looking at that and they're saying, we've got a, a disaster on our hands here economically. That creates opportunities. So you Pardon me, you see a lot of people in the renewables industry saying the way to get out of this is more green energy. And you're seeing a lot of people in business saying the way to get out of this is cut regulation and more flexible working conditions, cut taxes, those sorts of things. Um, so everyone's looking at, at this and saying the public know that there is a problem. We need to give them a solution. So to a certain extent coming out of this COVID crisis, we will see change because people will accept we do need change. And what we need to be careful is that we don't see the wrong sort of change. And that's exactly what I've been saying as well. With, with crisis, there's opportunities to change from a, a wrong track, which is just starting to, to peak. But uh, there's also other opportunists uh, during a, a crisis. And We've seen all the, the uh, particularly the, the state premiers of all uh, stripes wanting to, to massively increase uh, their control over over people's people's everyday lives. Uh, it's a bit different. Obviously, the attention was on uh, Tim Tim Smith, Liberal MP Dan, Dan here started calling Dan Andrews dictator Dan or, or Chairman uh, Dan. But there's there's other frustrating things with. Liberal Premier Stephen Stephen Marshall <coughs> and Gladys Berejiklian in in New South Wales uh, as well, and obviously Queensland uh, has uh, it, it's uh, the decisions by uh, its Premier uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk uh, today have been in the news where because it's the Parliament's been suspended since the uh, since the pandemic uh, was declared it hasn't hasn't sat has it. In Queensland? Yeah. No, no, it's sitting this week. In oh, fact, it's sitting this week. It's about a couple of weeks ago. Look, they put legislation in to um, uh, allow them to go through just before the election and not have a sitting. Um, but I think they worked out they weren't going to get away with that. So, no, they're sitting. Um, I think there's probably only about half the parliament, though. I think they're rostered on so they can do um, social distancing. Uh, there was the, the their last minute reversal of their decision to early release uh, prisoners uh, due to the at the time of the the pandemic there was a lot of uh, criminal justice uh, reform advocates saying that uh, we shouldn't we should uh, release uh, uh, some of those uh, prisoners early because the, the prisons can be incubators, but obviously with the curve still well and truly flat, including in Queensland, that something like that is is not necessary now. She she ended up making the the, the right decision at the last minute, but it's it's sort of the thing where politicians they they, they don't like to backflip, and even if it's the right decision, the media still calls them out. Yeah, no, I've been thinking about the whole COVID situation. Um, and 
what we're doing is a very unconventional way of dealing with uh, an epidemic. So what we've done in the past isn't lock up all the healthy people as well as the sick people. We've isolated the sick people um, and those people who are vulnerable and the rest of us have got on with life and, and some of us have caught disease and some of us in the past have died from it. Um, you know, I'm actually in the age group and, and I'm the gender and, and um, I've got another complication, which means that um, I'm a little bit more susceptible to COVID than um, other people. That's not unduly worrying me. I'm living my life just as I, I always have whilst keeping to the, the rules. Um, but what happened in the first place was we got these alarming um, studies about the uh, COVID virus, um, number of them that I saw published in The Lancet, suggesting that the um, uh, R0, R0, I think they call it, figure uh, could be as high as five and uh, that the fatality rate could be as high as 15%. Now, you look at something like that and with a sense of history, you say, this could be a little bit like the Black Death. We need to take emergency measures while we work out what's going on. But as time went on, we got more and more information that said, well, no, no, the R naught is not that high. And no, the fatality rate is nowhere near that high. Uh, there were people like John Iannidis, uh, who's at Stanford University, an epidemiologist who looked at a couple of um, situations and said, look, it's probably similar to a bad case of the flu. Uh, but what had happened by that stage is politicians had copied each other all around the world and they'd locked down or they'd started to lock down um, and they didn't adjust as new information came in. Uh, the only honourable exception of all of this is Sweden, really, at the moment. Um, and time has to tell yet whether their uh, experiment is uh, going to be superior to some of the others. Boris Johnson was going the Swedish direction, and then he got stampeded by some bad modelling from Imperial College. Um, and Britain went down into, into lockdown, even though their figures in Sweden are not dissimilar. In fact, I think Sweden's doing a bit better than they are at the moment. Um, but so you had politicians making decisions, but then they weren't brave enough to turn around when the facts had changed and say, look, we've made a mistake. We can loosen things off. So you were talking before about uh, uh, them being authoritarian. I refer to it as being a healthocracy that we're currently living in. You know, you go to see a doctor and your doctor says, this is what you should do. A lot of us do most of what our doctors say, but we don't do all of what our doctors say because we value other things just as highly as we value good health. You know, so there are people who go to their doctors and doctors say, you've got to get more exercise. You shouldn't work as hard. Uh, stop drinking as much. Um, don't stay up late, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People say, well, I actually value these things. Maybe my job is going to kill me sooner than it might have otherwise. But I like the money that I earn because it gives me quality of life, it gives my family quality of life, it gives my kids opportunities, <clears throat> it gives me pleasure. Um, it does good things for the world. Uh, so generally speaking, we take advice from our doctors. We don't necessarily follow it because we balance up uh, what we value. And as I say, it's not always health that we put first. You know, there's plenty of people who are glorified in our society who've put their health and their life on the line to achieve a greater good. And it's not that long since we celebrated Anzac Day and those young men who put their lives on hold and put them on the line and ran up that beach towards people with machine guns and artillery. Uh, so, so long life is not something that people necessarily uh, value above all else. Doctors, however, are trained to value life about all else. We've now got doctors telling politicians what to do, the doctors have got that frame of mind and the politicians are risk averse because if they make the wrong decision, voters will punish them. So that's my explanation for why we're in this um, healthocracy, uh, why we're being still locked down, even when the doctors are now saying, well, look, you don't need to close your borders. In fact, closing borders doesn't make much sense. You know, here we are in Queensland. Um, we close the border at New South Wales. They call Coolangatta and Tweed Heads the twin towns for the very good reason that most people who live in Coolangatta and most people who live in Tweed Heads don't draw a distinction about where it is they live, play and work. 
They, they do it on both sides of the border. There's a street called Boundary Street. It goes right down the border from Point Danger. There's houses on both sides of the street. People visit each other. They shop from New South Wales. They go across to Rainbow Bay. They shop at the convenience stores and, and so on there. You know, it's, it's an absurd thing to suggest that there's two different populations. What we should be doing is saying, look, vast swathes of the country don't have a problem with this COVID. If you're going to lock down places, if you're going to say to people, you can't travel, do it from hotspots. Don't do it from places which are completely identical to other places. That doesn't make any sense. But Anastasia Palaszczuk in this case is scared that if someone comes in from New South Wales and there's a death in Queensland, her head will be on the line. But the other thing she's ignoring is that by locking down, we're causing a whole lot of consequential deaths of people. You just don't see them. No one sees the uh, mental he health that's being um, compromised by the lockdowns. No one's seeing the suicides that are being caused by lockdowns and also the collapse of the economy. We're not seeing those people into the future who are going to be harmed by this. We're not seeing the people who are going to be harmed because they'll be pushed into poverty. And poverty is a good indicator and predictor of a uh, decrease in lifespan, etc. Those people will get to vote, but they won't necessarily attribute their lessened um, uh, standing in life and their, their lessened health to the Premier of Queensland either, she, so she won't necessarily get the blame. But if someone dies in an old people's home in the next six months, she will. So we've got those, all those sorts of psychological and social currents that are pushing us in a direction. And what we need is politicians to actually level with us. And we don't have a politician in the country who's doing that. You know, Scott Morrison's kind of edging there, but he's not prepared to, uh, to go all the way for whatever reason. Uh, Scott Morrison, when the, the, the curve uh, was peaking, uh, he, he said uh, at his uh, press conference when he was uh, rolling out the uh, restrictions uh, that whatever we do, we've got to do for uh, at least six months. That's clearly not going to be necessary now. And he seems completely at ease with... Uh, uh, winding uh, winding back that uh, proclamation but of course uh, other leaders are not such as Anastasia Palaszczuk saying she wants the state border to be closed until September and obviously there was a lot of media attention when the the New South Wales Queensland border was first uh, shut with the all, all the the checkpoints uh, uh, coming up now obviously that's still in force uh, have you got any information about uh, whether uh, that is being managed easier or it's still frustrating a lot of people? Uh, well, I've been over the border since the checkpoints have been in place. Um, you can get a, you can reasonably easily get a permit to go across if you have to work in uh, New South Wales and you're in Queensland. Um, so it's not a huge issue, but they've got streets blocked off. You have to go through um, the checkpoints. So, you know, that slows interstate travel down uh, and that's a major inconvenience to people down there. Uh, but it's, it's just also completely unnecessary. It, you know, it's, it's illogical. It's like, it's illogical to say that you can only have 10 people in a restaurant. You know, from my office here, um, there's a, a little restaurant strip up here and most of them will be hard pressed to have more than 10 people in most lunch times. You know, it's mostly takeaway trade. Great for them. Uh, there's a, a restaurant or a pub really near here called the Norman Hotel. Uh, it advertises itself as Brisbane's worst vegetarian restaurant. And that's because it specialises in big, fat, juicy steaks. And it's been so successful at that that it would probably take two to 300 people at capacity. Now to say to, an organ to a, a business like that, you can only take 10 people, doesn't make any sense at all. They could fit 100 people in there and they could be six metres apart and it'd still work. They might actually be able to make it work for themselves at that. It'd still work from a health point of view. So, you know, who makes up these ideas? I've got no, these rules. I've got no idea. But I'm pretty sure they've been copied from somewhere else because if we copy them from somewhere else, we can't get into trouble. And if someone else makes a silly decision to start with, we'll just replicate it like the virus replicates. I think our, 
our politicians they they're, they're still trapped in the the pre covid mindset is if that if they relax something or or change uh something in uh, 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 during, uh when they've previously said this is going to last this period this is what we're, we're, we've said the 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 public the, the the australian people obviously the uh the media and the, the the prominent social media uh commentators loved uh love to gotcha politicians or oh, you said this three months ago but look at what you're you're saying now they they need to get out of that uh, as scott morrison calls it the well the Canberra bubble, you could just call it the uh, political uh, bubble, and it, it, obviously the uh, there are still uh, uh, deaths uh, being recorded uh, from uh, coronavirus in Australia, albeit very very slowly. But I, I don't think it's if if there is a death in in Queensland in say the next three months from coronavirus, it's it's not going to have the a, a, the fallout that these leaders seem to, to fear? Um, we just have to be more realistic about mortality. The thing about life is that it is 100% fatal. You know the old story, two things you can't uh, escape, death and taxes. Well, you can escape taxes, you can't escape death. It's just a fundamental feature of life. And some of us die sooner than We'd rather. That's a hard thing to say, but it's a fact. And this is the first time where we've effectively applied the precautionary principle to an infectious disease. You know, we have, we have people dying from flu every year in the tens of thousands. Now, compared to that, this is a very minor um, manifestation. Um, now, they'll argue that's because we've locked down. But are we going to lock down every year when the flu comes along? Are we, are we seriously going to do that? Or are we going to say, look, there's a risk to everything. There's a risk to driving. There's a risk to walking. There's a risk to running. There's a risk to going to the gym. There's a risk to kissing your wife. There's a risk to sending your kids off to school on their own. No, there are risks everywhere. There's probably a risk sitting in here that a meteorite might come crashing through the... Uh, the roof. Now, I'm not going to get too worried about a meteorite coming crashing through the roof, but we know that meteorites have hit the earth in the past and uh, probably caused some uh, of the major extinction events that we've had. So these things might be remote, but they do happen. Risk is everywhere. And yet in this one instance, we have diverged from the common sense practice that as animals, we've been uh, observing for, you know, millions of years that you go out you take these risks because if you don't take risks, you can't live. You know, it's it's not a one or the other uh, choice. You can't have a life that's free of risk. And we this one occasion, it's, it's really stunned me that we have chosen on this particular disease to take the no risk um, uh, path. Uh, it's just insane. We can't keep doing it. And, and the fact of the matter is that they talk about eliminating it, but you can't eliminate it. We've had coronaviruses around for a very long time. The common cold is a coronavirus. There is no um, vaccine against the common cold. There's no guarantee there'll be a vaccine against the uh, COVID-19 either, um, but it's certainly not going to go away. It's going to be around. So the idea that we sit around and wait till either we have a vaccine or it disappears is lunatic. And if you think back to where we started, it was flatten the curve. What did flatten the curve mean? It didn't mean you're not going to catch the, the virus. It meant we're going to slow down the spread of the virus so that we're sure that if you do catch it, we can deal with you in the hospitals without them being overwhelmed. Somewhere after about a month, they decided that, oh, maybe we can beat this thing and bash it down. And when you watch the news every night, they have a count on the coronavirus infections and the deaths. Uh, as though, you know, it's a sort of reverse cricket match. Instead of trying to score as many runs as possible, you want to score as few runs. And when we get down to zero, we'll have won. Well, what the best health advice is, you'll never get down to zero. So you'll have never won in that way. And if you keep defining success as no infections, you're never going to succeed. 
And, and that will be a disaster for the country. So sometime they're going to actually have to change the narrative. They're going to have to level with us and say, well, we're never going to be able to completely deal with this thing, but we can't keep shut down forever. And if they don't change the narrative, I think you'll find that the populace will eventually. Uh, uh, what you've described, it's it's mission creep, and that's what we were were sold as that uh, we've got to have all these these shutdowns uh, just so we can flatten the curve and not overwhelm our hospital system. As soon as uh, the curve was flat, that should have been uh, I I the end of all the uh, the shutdown restrictions. And of course, everyone forgets that the ba basically the the magic ingredient that uh, Australia has used to to flatten the coronavirus curve is uh, suspend international travel, uh, which a lot of other countries have not done. That's not talked about uh, as much as it should be. Yeah. Look, I think there's also another factor there. I don't know whether it's um, struck you, but it's curious that both New Zealand and Australia have extremely low rates of COVID-19 infection. And when you look at the uh, globe and you look at countries, you see that in the Southern Hemisphere and around the equator, there's much lower rates of infection than there are, for example, in Europe and North America and Canada. And this, there's got to be a climate or other factor going on there. Now, with COVID, you're more likely to catch it internally, so inside, um, and you appear to catch it mostly from aerosols, so people breathing out. And people who cough or people who sneeze breathe out a lot more uh, than people who are just um, standing there talking normally or just breathing or just breathing. Um, when you're outside, um, there's a much larger body of air, carries aerosols away a lot faster. So if people are outside a lot, they're unlikely to catch it. So if someone jogs past you with COVID, very low chance you're going to get a, a large enough load uh, to be in trouble with it. Uh, it also doesn't do well with higher temperatures and uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation. Um, we also know that vitamin D is an important factor in fighting uh, infections, viral infections. And if you're out getting a lot of sun, you're getting a lot of vitamin D. Um, so it's more than possible that our success with COVID-19 isn't so much anything we've done, but the fact that we were in summer when this thing struck. The places that got hit by it hard were in winter. They're now starting to come out of winter into summer, but even now you look at the temperatures in England and uh, even you guys down there in Victoria are probably enjoying much more balmier conditions. Uh, Victoria is nothing to compared to the, the coldness of, of England. Yep, so you've got people inside um, because it's too cold to go outside. You've got low vitamin D, so easier for them to get infected. A um, whole range of things happening. There's a reason we have a flu season and it's in winter. And no one seems to be, when I read the literature, no one's 100% sure why it is we get a flu season, but we do get a flu season. And these sorts of factors all play into the explanation as to why we have a flu season. This is a virus. There's likely to be a COVID season. And we may, in fact, be heading into the COVID season at the moment. So it's quite possible you'll actually see, as we relax, the uh, rate of infection will go up. Um, and the last thing we can afford is for politicians to then say, oh, sorry, got to close the economy down again. Yeah, because we can't we can't ever afford to to do this again. That's that's pretty clear. Another uh, uh, area where uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk uh, has has put uh, Queensland uh, or pr uh, probably uh, out on its own is with the uh, uh, the no jab uh, no play uh, uh, policy for professional sports people that uh, they, they cannot they cannot come to play in Queensland unless uh, they receive a, a flu vaccination and of course there's there's been those uh, a, a, that cohort of, of NRL players who've uh, resisted uh, uh, Queensland is an NRL uh, state it's also where uh, the uh, Western Australian and South Australian uh, AFL teams are going to be based uh, because of the hard border closures, 
uh, there. Even and of course Anastasia Palaszczuk, she she did the 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 flu vaccine demonstration for the uh, the cameras. And I don't want to get into the the antivax uh, rabbit hole as it's as it's termed, but the flu vaccine it doesn't protect you from the coronavirus. It's just it protects you from the common winter flu. Yeah, well, I think that's an example of people taking a crisis and using it to advantage. Now, I've got some sympathy with the uh, the footballers. I've never had uh, a flu vaccine uh, for a number of reasons. One is that um, uh, there's a possibility you get just as sick with the flu mm. vaccine as, as if you had the flu. And the other is that they only uh, vaccinate you against a spectrum of flu, certainly not the overall split spectrum. I've never had a, a bad flu experience, so... Uh, I've taken a decision not to be vaccinated for the flu. Um, I'm vaccinated for a whole lot of other things. So I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I've had my children vaccinated. Uh, but, you know, there's a whole lot of things that are necessary. Um, and there's a whole lot of things that are voluntary. Uh, my partner just recently went overseas and you, you can go to someone called a travel doctor and they'll advise you on the various shots and so on um, that you can have. And Penny came came home and, uh, you know, she decided to have some, but not others. She said, well, I don't think really the cost's justified by what I'm avoiding here. So, you know, it's no different from most of the other things in life. One ought to have a choice as to whether you have a flu vaccine or not. Um, but I think what happened in the case of Queensland was that there's been a, uh, a problem, um, well, it's Australia-wide, with um, childcare centres, with children not having uh, vaccines for measles, mumps, etc., those sorts of things. Um, and um, so it's kind of got, got um, wrapped up in this. There's an anti-vaxxer group amongst the footballers, which the public health officials are trying to marginalise. So the fact that some of these footballers wouldn't have this vaccine was linked to the fact that some of them and their partners are against vaccines in general. And well, hang on, we're gonna make them do it as a demonstration that no one's above our health edicts. I think that's what was going on there. Um, my point of view is that perhaps their employers could have been in a position to say, well, hang on, I think you should have it because we don't want you infecting any of your teammates and you're gonna be in very close quarters with them. Well, that's an employment situation you can handle under an employment contract. Um, but for a state government to say, you can't come here unless you've had it, that's absolutely absurd. And just while we're talking about vaccines, one of the uh, interesting sidelights um, is that uh, there is some speculation that the um, um, uh, vaccine that we got in Queensland, I'm not sure whether you got it in, um, in Victoria, um, um, but we got this vaccine against, um, um, oh, what's it called, tuberculosis. And there's some speculation that gives you some resistance to the COVID virus. New South Wales, it wasn't compulsory, so people down there didn't have it. And that's one potential explanation for why there was more infection in New South Wales than up here. So it's interesting the vaccines play in different ways in this issue. Uh, Western Australia, not only did they have the, the hard border closure, but they also had uh, intra-state uh, restrictions. They, they split up their, their state into to regions. And I know that uh, uh, George Christensen, the, the federal member for, for, for Dawson up in Mackay, was saying, well, if WA can, can do that, why can't uh, uh, Queensland, the, the region, central north Queensland, where local uh, health uh, is not uh, as uh, can handle as much capacity as, as down there in the, the southeast? Why can't we have an uh, interstate border uh, closures and Anastasia Palaszczuk said, oh, it can't be done, uh, even though uh, she closed the, uh, the, the most uh, populous uh, border uh, in the state between uh, Queensland uh, and New South Wales. And now that we're coming out of the, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, 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 she, ha she hasn't budged on this, Anastasia Palaszczuk, uh, much uh, to uh, l uh, relax the restrictions more in the, the regions where there has been uh, less uh, infections. 
Yeah, well, as I was saying earlier on, it would make some sense to um, quarantine areas which are hotspots of, um, of um, infection. Um, but state borders are basically administrative borders. Um, they're uh, boundaries, rather. Uh, they're accidents of history as much as anything else. At one stage, there was a proposal to, because Queensland was split off from New South Wales, um, and there was a proposal that the uh, uh, Northern Tablelands, the uh, New England Tablelands area of um, New South Wales, down to the coast somewhere around Grafton should be part of Queensland. And I think there's a lot of se there's some good common sense to that, but it didn't happen. Um, but um, uh, so the, the border where it is is as much an accident of politics as anything else. It doesn't define anything in terms of health. Um, and you've got people in Western Queensland, they've never had any infections out there. Yet if you're a pub in Western Queensland, you can only have 20 people in at the moment for some obscure reason. As George Christensen was pointing out in his area, no or, or virtually none, uh, no infections. Uh, why should they be subject to the same strictures as, say, Brisbane, where we had some? Um, so it's just further irrationality. Um, and um, it will probably come back to play in the state election, I think, uh, because what we're doing with this hard border is um, not only is it irrational in terms of your population movements inside the state, but it's irrational in that the tourism industry is going to suffer significantly because Queensland does good tourist trade um, in the winter months when people from down south come up for the warmer temperature. So you've got places like Cairns um, where um, Great Barrier Reef, uh, you've got the hinterland up to the Atherton Tablelands, up to Cape York. Um, their tourism is going to be limited to people from Queensland and most people from Queensland probably aren't going to go up uh, all that way. Um, you'd have to drive up, I suppose, at the moment. I'm not sure what the air flight situation is. Um, so when you've got an election at the end of this year and those economies are going to be devastated, so I'd be looking for someone to blame. And when you look at the people who are suffering most from this, um, it's younger people who are a group who tend to favour Labor at the moment, um, but who can get quite angry about things. And it's people in less secure employment and generally the, the lower income employment. It's going to affect the building trade soon. Um, so there's a lot of um, men particularly, young men, tradies uh, in those industries uh, who, if they're given a sufficient reason to, to vote for someone else, may well do it. And the party in Queensland, well, there's a couple of parties, actually. The party who historically has um, appealed to some of those groups is One Nation. Uh, and they do particularly well in North Queensland. Another party that will appeal well to them is the Catter Party. And again, they do particularly well in North Queensland. In fact, that's the only place that they, uh, they do well because they're a, a party that sprang to life uh, around that Mount Isa Townsville area. Uh, so these border closures in another, how many months time is it? Six months roughly? Uh, may indirectly, it won't necessarily be the border closure itself, but people will be looking for someone to blame for their diminished living standards. And it'll be the person who's in power, who's Anastasia Palaszczuk. Uh, certainly when uh, we're at the, the peak of the, the pandemic and the, the curve, uh, state and, and federal uh, oppositions found themselves basically they they didn't know how to react because that's when they I guess the the, the slogan which uh, we, we've all uh, by now uh, uh, pretty much uh, can't stand is we're all in this together but we're we're now seeing the uh, po uh, politics and the political discussion about the the issues uh, return to uh, pre uh, pa uh, pandemic. Uh, levels and you mentioned that uh, Queensland Parliament uh, is 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 back this week and I'm not sure if there's been any further uh, polling but uh, every well the last two Queensland elections have been uh, uh, very very close 
and even though the the LNP has done uh, extremely well at the the federal level for uh, many years, not just at the last uh, federal election, but it was the uh, uh, the Queensland Liberal and National parties that gave John Howard the uh, majority. Uh, in the Senate, and there's plenty to be unhappy with the, the Palaszczuk government uh, about, and uh, a lot of the, uh, the the controversy stemmed from her former deputy premier and and treasurer uh, Jackie Trad, who has finally uh, come undone in in the past few weeks. Um, yeah, um, so in Queensland, you have a um, uh, a bit of a split between the urban southeast, <clears throat> the rural areas, and also North Queensland. Um, Jackie Trad uh, is the leader of the left wing caucus in the state ALP. She's the member for South Brisbane. Uh, South Brisbane is an interesting seat. It's um, been the seat of premiers. Anna Bly was the member for South Brisbane, but so was Vince Gare. Uh, uh, not Vince Gare, um, um, oh, anyway, um, the last uh, Labor pre Premier of uh, Queensland is split from the uh, ALP over the uh, uh, communist question. Anyway, uh, it, it used to be the heart of the shipping industry in Brisbane. So it was a Labor seat because of a whole lot of working class people. It's gentrified over the, uh, the uh, last, um, or that be 60 years. Um, and now it's the heart of green left politics. Yeah. West End yeah. is, uh, to, to put it in, in terms my, my audience uh, might understand, West End, which is in the seat of South Brisbane and the federal seat of Griffith is basically the Antifa headquarters of Brisbane. Um, well, I haven't seen a lot of Antifa up here, I think. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the sort of the basic how how I summarise it for my audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's um, oh look, it's not dissimilar to the territory that Adam Bant's in. You know, yeah, your, uh, Fitzroy your in you know, Melbourne, got a, New Town, got a whole lot of in workers' there. cottages. Um, that and, and we have these wooden cottages up here. You have tend to have brick and um, and so on down there. But uh, people think they're cute. They're easy to extend. Um, so you can turn what was a, a modest working man's cottage into a mansion um, with uh, the application of a whole lot more wooden tin. Uh, they're close to the city, uh, close to public transport, um, and they're in short supply. So the prices go through the roof. Um, and uh, but you still got a you still got an interesting mix of poverty and wealth in these areas. And you know I'm talking about an area that I grew up in, Tim. Um, I grew up at East Brisbane, a couple of blocks away from the Wollongabba Cricket Ground. Um, and uh, uh, it's still, I think, in, uh, in Jackie's electorate where I grew up. I just live outside of these days. Um, so it was an interesting uh, place. I've seen it change over the years. And there's still, despite the wealth, there's still a lot of poverty. And the sort of wealthy people who move here, they actually like a little bit of poverty. They feel that they've got a bit of gritty realism going on, I think, in their lives. Um, but they tend to be very green. Uh, they tend to be very anti-mining. Uh, they tend to uh, be very anti-agriculture. Um, even though they're big consumers of the good things of life, uh, they think they tend to, to see farmers as a stereotype of vandals who damage the environment and uh, torture their animals. Uh, when, when you go and talk to a a fair dinkum farmer, you find that it's exactly the reverse, but that's the kind of stereotype they work on. So they don't think farmers ought to be able to manage their land, so they're in favour of uh, uh, stopping them clearing trees. Um, they're against live exports, which are a big issue in, in North Queensland, um, and in fact throughout the whole state, because there's a lot of um, beef grown here. Um, they're against coal mining, particularly Adani, uh, and they want to put uh, solar panels and, um, and wind farms all over the place. Oh, and they're against dams as well. Um, so uh, uh, the sorts of things that do well for a Jackie Trad down here uh, do very poorly for the Labor Party up north. Uh, on top of that, uh, the Greens do so well in Jackie's seat that they are a real risk to her. So that drives her even further 
to the left. Um, and they're a bigger risk this election because the LNP has said that they will direct preferences to the Greens, not to Jackie. So she basically needs to get about 40% of the vote or she won't be coming back after the next election. Um, on top of that, um, Jackie's seen as basically being, or was seen anyways, basically being the puppeteer of the uh, State Labor Party. <coughs> so pardon me, Anastasia Palaszczuk was the figurehead, um, but uh, everyone suspected that Jackie had her fingers up uh, behind the collar of uh, Anna's uh, 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 shirt and was manipulating what came out of her. And uh, to a certain extent that's changed because Jackie has had to resign from the cabinet uh, because she's under investigation by the Triple C. Now, I'm not suggesting that she's done anything wrong and, and that the Triple C will, will find that charges ought to be brought against her. And, you know, for anything serious to happen to, to Jackie, it's not just that the Triple C make a finding, but that a court upholds that finding. Uh, but for the moment, she's been taken out of the headlines. So it changes the dynamic up here to some extent. Um, and it also explains why the Labor Party hasn't done as well as it might like to in country areas, um, but doesn't explain why the LNP hasn't managed to pick up from the ALP in those areas, why the vote's gone to minor parties mostly, uh, being Qatar and One Nation, and why Labor, despite all of this, has still managed to hold seats in Townsville and Cairns. She'd had a previous controversy uh, late last year about uh, an investment property uh, she'd, she'd bought uh, in the uh, south of Brisbane, which was earmarked for future uh, government uh, development. And uh, that was around about the time the, the CFMEU, their state secretary, Michael Aravba, was, was well, uh, uh, the union, didn't they hold a rally uh, 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 calling on her uh, resignation and it uh, it was another union leader Gary Bullock of the the United Workers Union who uh, delivered the, the the fatal blow when she she did uh, uh, resign so it, it seems like that the uh, the push to out, oust her and or hold her uh, or uh, 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 make sure that uh, she was held to uh, account or is is put under proper in investigation was from her own side rather than the LNP? Um, I don't think that uh, Bullock was um, after justice. I think he was after another election win. Um, the reason she's stood down completely is because she was becoming a liability. Um, but, you know, you've got to draw a distinction there between them wanting to do the right thing or wanting to be seen to do the right thing. And I think it was appearances uh, rather than substance. I would think Jackie's probably still wielding a fair bit of power behind the scenes. I don't think she's gone away. I don't think she intends to go away. Um, I don't see how a powerful factional player like that could disappear while they're still in the parliament. And she's recontesting a seat. And if she does win, despite the LNP preference deal, she'll be back again. And I think she'll make herself um, herself felt. You know, she's an extraordinarily powerful person. She's personally forceful, so I'm told. Um, and uh, those sort of people can rehabilitate themselves and get back into power. Um, maybe not without difficulty, but despite the difficulty, they can do it. So I wouldn't write Jackie off and I wouldn't read too much into her faction telling her that she had to stand down apart from them trying to save their own skins. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the, the preference uh, deal. The the LNP is is going to be directing in South Brisbane their preference to the Greens rather than uh, Jackie Trad, which is a a break from probably the consensus of the past uh, decade since uh, it was Liberal preferences that elected Adam Bant uh, in Melbourne, which I suppose mm. is a testament to just how bad Jackie Trady is compared to the, the Greens. But that brings in the, the issue of uh, Queensland now has full preferential voting. It used to have what New South Wales is optional preferential voting where you could put just one or you could put one to eight, however many uh, uh, candidates there, there were. And 
it, it, the the two party preferred just included the the, the preferences that hadn't been uh, exhausted, but it has led to and that's why a lot of people don't like preferential uh, voting legislation passed to secure uh, a preference deals and obviously with Jackie Trad uh, being under threat from the the Greens, uh, they. Uh, the Palaszczuk government has has passed laws that in, infringe upon uh, farmers' uh, rights. They they even wanted to reduce the capacity uh, of a of a dam uh, as well, and which of course is. Are you it, talking about the Paradise Dam? Yes. Oh, that's a that's a safety issue there. I don't think um, they want to be doing what they're doing, but they can't um, escape that the um, the dam's structurally unsound. Um, there are questions as to um, whether they should have consulted uh, better with the people who currently um, 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 depend on the dam. And that dam was put in to turn the Bundaberg area into a super um, area for producing uh, fruit and vegetables. And there's been a lot of investment there. Um, things like um, avocado farms and um, almond orchards. Um, that was done on the basis of the dam and now the dam uh, is in risk of failing. So they've had to reduce the level. But they did that without telling the local community. They said to the local community, um, look, we're going to be releasing the water, but before we release it, you can take water out. Um, however, the time at which they said you can take water out wasn't a time when anyone needed the water. So the water basically went down the, uh, the river um, so, you know, there's a whole lot of bungles uh, which illustrate that the government doesn't understand the complexities of life for people in business uh, and people in agriculture. Um, I doubt whether an LNP government would have handled it the same way because it would have been plenty of people around that cabinet table who would have said, hang on, you can't just get rid of the water like that. And yes, there might be a risk of flooding, but these places flood frequently. Maybe we should go and consult with the locals and say, look, there's a 10 or 20% chance that this might fail and this will be the consequences. However, um, there's all this water in there. You guys need, to, need it to grow. How do we deal with this in a way where the risk is acceptable to you and the outcome's acceptable to you and it's not unacceptable to us? They didn't do any of that. They just went in, made decisions uh, which were not um, consonant with the needs of the uh, rural community. So it's more an overall issue that they just don't get uh, it, what are uh, basically the uh, the needs and uh, of uh, people in rural areas and just don't know how to properly talk to them. I don't think it's just rural areas. I just don't think this is a competent government. You know, I, I've got friends on the Labor side uh, with a deep pedigree who say, this is a bad government. Uh, it's full of people who are advisors to politicians. It's full of people who've never done anything with their life other than politics. When I look at it, it reminds me of the student union councils back when I was at university. You know, these are people who are good at winning trivial arguments, who are good at rigging the rules to favour themselves, but who are very poor at achieving anything that really matters. Uh, we, we spoke at the beginning about uh, Campbell Newman's effort to, to rein in the the excesses of the the state and the the, the public service, and of course that's all been uh, reversed under the the Palaszczuk uh, government with the uh, more public servants uh, being being put on, and I already mentioned the the state debt. Uh, but of course, the the way that they spin that is we've got more frontline workers. Um, well, yeah, that's what they do. And that's that's a typical Labor pitch. I mean, uh, for a Labor government, you can never spend enough money on services. And when Labor voters, people who are rusted on Labor, are considering who they're going to vote for, they don't look at performance, they look at expenditure. Um, so uh, if you're going to be successful on the uh, conservative side of politics, you need to get people looking at performance and you need to get them understanding that just spending more money on something doesn't get you a better outcome. 
Uh, and if you can't convince them of that, then you're always going to lose the argument. So, you know, one of the mistakes I think the LNP's made is to try and uh, outbid the government here, not on health, but on education. Uh, so one of their policies is let's put an extra air conditioner in every school. Well, when you've got a public mindset, which is that you're the party that always cuts in education, they're going to trust the ALP to put those air conditioners in before they trust the LNP. Now, what the LNP has to do in education is concentrate on the appalling outcomes that we're getting out of our education system in Queensland. You know, that we lag the rest of the state, we lag the rest of the world. And in fact, in historical terms, back in the 70s, we had a first rate education system. So we lag our forebears, we lag the baby boomers in terms of what we're delivering. Uh, when it comes to health, um, you know, Campbell actually did a good job in health. Uh, and a lot of the, the credit for that has to go to uh, the health minister at the time, uh, Lawrence Springwall, who was a former leader of the opposition. And Lawrence got in there and he did a good job. And the way they sold it was, we'll get rid of the waiting lists. Uh, it wasn't more doctors and nurses. It was, you shouldn't have to have ambulances ramping. There should be enough capacity there. They brought in a guarantee that if we can't fix you or we can't suit you in the public hospital system within a period of time, we'll pay for it to be done in the private hospital system. Um, he got in there and he had a fight with the doctors about the amount they were getting paid. But that was done on the basis of the outcomes that we can give people. So you've got to get into those arguments. Um, otherwise, Labor will just keep talking about how much extra they're going to spend. And the problem with those performance arguments is they're often difficult to have from opposition. They're much easier to have from government. So if you're going to win an election, uh, often what you've got to do is just avoid those issues where Labor's going to outspend you altogether, focus on the issues where you can win. Having said that, the 95 state election, I know it's ancient history, but we were able to demonstrate that under the Goss government, there are actually fewer hospital beds after six years than there've been at the beginning. So those sorts of things actually did tell. You know, they'd say we're spending extra money. Mm. We'd say, where is it? You can't see it. If you're spending extra money, there ought to be more hospital beds. There aren't. People are dying because they can't get into your hospital. So you can win that argument, but you've got to start framing it in those terms. And um, at the moment, I think there are more hospital beds than there were when they got into power. So, you know, that, that line wouldn't work. They are getting some uh, bang for their buck. It reminds me when a, a, a government claims that uh, we've spent this, uh, we've employed these people, that uh, 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 that famous Yes Minister episode with the, the new hospital where it does all these things but it has uh, no patients, which is obviously that's a more absurd well, we've example. we achieved that with the coronavirus, Tim. <laughs> yeah. There's no one in hospitals. This hospital's going broke because they can't treat anyone. Well, so it's worse issue. in Victoria. Oh, well, uh, it's it, it, uh, it's been taken to its max in Victoria with the well, the nationalisation of the the private hospitals uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they've done a bit of that up here as well. Uh, but you know, I'm hearing stories of people in emergency wards who are twiddling their thumbs because no one's driving, so there's no car accidents. No one's going to pubs, so there's no brawls, mm. and the druggies are staying home. They're not going out and they're needing to be treated. Um, so there's huge spare capacity at the moment in the hospital system. Um, and again, that ought to be, that ought to be an issue, you know, because there are people who are dying because we're not using our hospitals properly. Uh, so you've described uh, in quite detail what is wrong with the, uh, the Palaszczuk uh, government, uh, which in, in both our views uh, should be enough to see it thrown out. So what does the, the LNP need to do to, to win uh, the election? Uh, Deb Frecklington, uh, she, uh, she tries to get her uh, face out in the media uh, as much as, as possible. The, the way I see it, she's, she, 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 put, uh, she projects a very sort of motherly uh, persona, but it does look to a degree 
uh, artificial. She's from the, the, the Darling Downs, which is in Western Queensland, uh, just past Toowoomba. Uh, that's old uh, uh, Sir Joby Yockey Peterson uh, uh, territory. But uh, as I know, we have, of course, on the, the anniversary of the, the Morrison miracle, we shouldn't put too much on on polls, but what does she need to do and what does the LNP need to do in the, the five months before election day? Yeah, she actually represents the seat that Bjorki Peterson uh, represented, um, had a different name when he was the uh, Sananango, now it was Barambar back then. Uh, but it's not, you say Western Queensland, the road system's that good, you can get there in an hour and a half from Brisbane. Um, so it's, it's really more or less southeast Queensland. And um, she's, while she's a, a farmer, she's um, uh, more a southeast Queensland person than a, a rural person. Um, what does she have to do? Well, <clears throat> what you've got to understand about elections is that people at the end of the day vote for politicians who they think will do something for them. Um, so, A, you need to have enough substance that they think that whatever you promise, you'll deliver, uh, or at the very least, that voting for you is a respectable thing to do uh, and you can send a message to the government by voting for you. So that's, that's one thing she has to, to do. And the various appearances that she does, that's all about creating that um, sense of substance. Um, but secondly, you, you actually have to be promising to do something for people that they want and you've got to do that in a way that they can easily comprehend it. Um, you know, I think the master of um, political communication at the moment, although when you watch his press conferences, doesn't necessarily appear to be the case, is Donald Trump. So you know what he stands for. It's make America great. And make America great encapsulates a whole lot of different things. And it's about national security. So when he talks about building the wall, uh, it's about being able to control your, your own country. Um, make America great. It's about um, not letting other countries tell you what to do. It's about getting your industry going again. So it, it encompasses a whole lot of things. He doesn't have to spell policies out in detail. Just that MAGA cuts through. Um, Deb doesn't have that uh, theme that pulls it all together. And that's what she needs to win an election. So she needs to reach a standard that people are happy to vote for, but then she has to be able to show people <clears throat> that she stands for the things that they want. And she has to have that in a simple phrase, which allows them to grasp it intuitively and immediately. Now she's kind of there on the first, I wouldn't say she's all the way there, um, but she's certainly not there on the second. And one of the problems that I see in the presentation is a follower on Instagram, I see her doing a whole lot of nice um, appearances, but they're not tied together in a, a story which will convince people to vote for her. You know, it's just like anyone else's Instagram uh, account or Facebook account. Here I am doing this, here I am doing that. Okay, so you're a regular person. We don't necessarily want a regular person. We want a leader. Show us how you're going to lead Show us what you're going to do. Um, she's not doing that at the moment. The party isn't doing that. They are trying to do a, a, a small target strategy so they don't put too much stuff out there that the other side can attack. Um, they have on the, the COVID uh, issue pushed a little bit to open the, the uh, state up faster. So they've got their own timetable that they'd like to see the state adhering to certainly has the border being open sometime before September. But I don't hear them out in the media pushing Anastasia and saying, this is absurd. Open that border now. Our friends live in Tweed Heads. If you bothered to get out of your electorate and move down to the Gold Coast and talk to the people there, you'd realise they need that border open. They're not doing that kind of stuff. And they don't, don't have that theme. The other issue is they need to deal with some of the negatives that we know are going to come up and can could derail the campaign. Coal mining is one of those. So if you look at 
where the seats are that they hold and where the seats are that they can win. Um, the seats that they hold are, as you said earlier, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast. They hold almost all the seats in those two areas. The other area where they hold seats is what I call rural Queensland. So I wouldn't say Western Queensland. Most of the, the seats are places like the Darling Downs and moving up just west of the Great Divide. So they're in the hinterland, really, of a lot of the, the coastal areas. And if you look at a lot of these coastal seats, they go up pretty close to where those strong National Party seats um, are held. When you get up to Mount Isa, which is where I'm talking about Western Queensland there, that's Catter country. They're not, they're not holding that territory now. And North Queensland, they, they don't hold that territory. In fact, they're not even competitive outside of Townsville and, and Cairns. It's One Nation and Catter that are competitive there. And they don't hold any seats in Townsville or Cairns. They hold some seats a bit, bit south of there on the coast. Um, so the seats that are there to be won are in the southeast corner. They're Brisbane. Brisbane is not, as you said, a Liberal town. It has a Liberal Council. The Liberal Council has 23 of the 26 seats, uh, 23, something like that. No, not quite that many. It might be 22 of the 26 seats in the, um, in the uh, Council plus the Lord Meralty. Um, Labor only has roughly four. But when you look at the state seats, the LNP have four. Labor has five, that's right, in the council. LNP in the state has only four seats in the city of Brisbane. And when you get to the wider uh, rim around it, which includes Redlands, um, Redcliffe, um, sort of around uh, Caboolture, Moray Field, out to Ipswich, down to Logan City, they only have a couple of seats in that area. If you look at those seats at a federal level, their seats uh, like Dixon, held by Peter Dutton, where he got a swing to him. Um, Petrie, uh, held by uh, Luke Howarth, who got a swing to him. Bert Mannon, down on the south in Ford, uh, he got a swing to him. But the state Liberal Party, the state LNP, are way off the pace in those seats. So their challenge is not to get wedged, for example, by Adani, which is what they got wedged by partly in the last election. You had the Greens coming in and saying Adani's the big issue. That was all the media wanted to talk about. And the LNP didn't have an answer that would keep people in North Queensland happy and people in Brisbane happy. So that's number one. Number two is their relation with One Nation. You know, they need to have an answer which keeps people happy on that, and they don't. And I think that the answer that they can have that can win on that is partly about the culture wars. Because the reason that people like uh, Dutton win as well as they do in those seats is that they understand what drives ordinary Queenslanders. And they have an attitude and, and a bearing which relates to those people. And for whatever reason, the LNP isn't able to reach across to those sorts of basically working class, upper, lower, lower middle class constituencies. And if they can't do that, then they're always going to have trouble winning in Queensland. Uh, so you think, uh, because post the, the, the federal election, the, the Palaszczuk government basically rolled over on Adani and, and gave all the, the ticks uh, they'd been been holding back, that, uh, uh, that sort of... Uh, coal mining and uh, electricity uh, issue because at the federal level there, there's quite uh, a, pro a prominent uh, uh, pro-coal and also pro-nuclear pro LNP uh, members such as Matt Canavan uh, and uh, Keith Pitt who is who's the new uh, resources minister. I mentioned George Christensen uh, before, so that doesn't translate to a, a state at the, the the state uh, electoral pendulum. Um, oh, they do. Uh, the LNP do okay in um, those those areas where those members come from federally. Um, Keith Pitt and, and Matt Canavan's uh, based up the coast in uh, Rockhampton, I think. Um, they do okay there. I mean, Rockhampton's a Labor heartland, always has been. You'd be very lucky to win that. In fact, I think the only time. Uh, 
LNP. Uh, one, it was with Rex Pillbeam, who was the local mayor, and we're talking back in the 70s then. Uh, that was an extraordinary situation. Um, but the surrounding rural areas, they, they do reasonably well, but it's once you get up past there, they, um, they don't um, uh, do particularly well, um, um, basically, uh, well, just south of Townsville, north. Um, and they, uh, they kicked the member for um, uh, the Sundays out of their, um, their party. Yes, um, uh, I, suspect, uh, I suspect he'll get re-elected. Uh, Jason uh, Costigan, uh, That's he right, founded yeah. the, the North Queensland uh, uh, First Party. Uh, was he like so? He uh, by by what you've uh, uh, just said, he certainly hasn't been disgraced. He's just been kicked out of the party. Well, look, there were accus accusations of kind of sexual impropriety. Um, Perhaps he's done no worse than Joe Biden or Bill Clinton. Uh, but um, it apparently was a mortal sin in the uh, LNP. Uh, but up in the country that he comes from, um, I suspect it won't do him any damage at all and that uh, they won't be able to dislodge him. But I could be wrong on that. I, you know, I haven't been up there in maybe 20 years. So um, uh, and I don't have any contacts there. So I could well be reading it wrong from here. But um, the seats, the number, so they need about nine seats. Those seats, there's a couple in North Queensland that are potentials, but the bulk of them are in Brisbane and surrounds, places where Campbell Newman did well, places where Joe Bielke Peterson used to do well, um, but places where the Queensland Liberal Party, which was half of the LNP, didn't do very well at all. Um, and um, I think that, you know, there's a bit of a hangover uh, from that. And um, Deb's, um, I think she's, um, she looks too much like a Liberal and, and not enough like a National, even though, as I say, she comes from a farm. Uh, and she's not talking the, uh, the right language. And it's just little things that you see. Um, for example, there was a story in the Sunday Mail the other day, I think it was the Sunday Mail, saying how many women candidates the LNP had pre-selected. Now, I think Campbell Newman had a woman problem uh, in terms of the, the amount of representation in his state parliamentary team, which was ironic because in his council team, he had a majority of women. Um, but state government, I can remember going in there to listen to a friend's maiden speech and looking down and seeing a sea of blue pinstripe suits and thinking, there's something wrong going on there. Just on the balance of probabilities, there ought to be a lot more women in that group. So it has been an issue, but the sort of people that worry overly about that are the sort of people who will never vote yeah, exactly. for the LNP. Uh, the people who vote for the LNP, and I've had experience of trying to broaden the uh, board of our, um, our think tank uh, because you know we didn't have a wide enough experience and we needed uh, a better representation of, of women on it. And I, I spoke to a woman who's been quite successful in the local government elections, actually, and she took umbrage when I said, you know, we're looking to expand it. It was, hang on, I'm worth having on your board because of who I am, not because of my gender. And that's the attitude that people on the LNP side of the fence most often have. So to go out there and do a... a um, a deliberate pitch to a newspaper and get that story says you don't get it those people who are impressed by that are not going to vote for you the people who aren't impressed by it are the people whose votes you actually need that's not the kind of story you need you need a story where you you're dovetailing into their concerns um, and you know they've got a number of concerns freedom of speech political correctness is one of those things um, jobs is another. Uh, they're more interested in jobs than they are in fancy wind farms, for example. Yet the LNP up here have gone for the doctor uh, on renewable energy. They ought to be talking about um, dams. They ought to be talking about uh, storage because all this renewable energy is getting jammed into the system. There's no batteries there. So when the sun's not shining and when the wind's not blowing, it's good old fashioned coal-fired power that's having to shoulder the task, 
And the problem is coal-fired power is not made to switch on and off at the um, uh, uh, click of your fingers. Um, so that's creating all sorts of problems. Uh, they're not talking about those sorts of things. They're going the Labor agenda. And, I, you know, I think that's part of their problem in these uh, outer urban, regional, um, uh, commuter, working class areas. Uh, sounds similar to uh, the, the problems that uh, the Victorian uh, Liberal opposition has had uh, in the past. Uh, I, uh, we've talked about the, 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 the city of, of Brisbane being a, a Liberal uh, stronghold, and that uh, continued uh, uh, from when uh, Campbell Newman resigned as, as Lord Mayor to become opposition leader. Uh, Graham Quirk was the, the Lord Mayor after him, uh, and now... Uh, the uh, the Lord Mayor uh, is are you, are you, uh, Adrian. How do you say Adrian Schriner? Schriner uh, recently uh, got re-elected as well. What what sort of makes that click that uh, the the Liberal Party has had such such success in a well a a a, a city centric uh, council area. Um, well, city, city councils are different from any other level of government. Uh, you're taking a very short historical view. Um, so back in about 1972, I think it was, Clem Jones won such a large majority that there was only one opposition seat in the council. And that was a seat out in Indrapilly, which at that stage was a... Uh, um, up and coming uh, rich area of town, but the whole of the rest of Brisbane was Clem Jones. Um, Sally Ann Atkinson was the first to claw back from that. And she did reasonably well, but she only got, um, what was it, two terms? Uh, and then got bundled out um, um, by a no name candidate called Jim Sawley, who then imprinted himself fairly strongly on the, uh, on the party. Uh, and it was really only after Jim went that Campbell managed to win. And Campbell was a minority Lord Mayor when he first won. Uh, and he had to work with David Hinchliffe, who led the Labor Party and who was his deputy mayor. Um, Campbell did a, a good job. And um, so the, um, the council swung to Campbell, basically, and Graham managed to keep it going. So I think what you're seeing at a local government level in Brisbane is that there's a reward for good governance. Uh, it's also difficult to get rid of city council administrations because the media don't spend a lot of time covering them. So it's a very thankless task being opposition leader in the council because you hardly ever get anything in the paper, let alone on the front page. You've got to really have things going badly uh, for you to stand a chance. Um, so Sally Ann, when she got in, uh, she had a, a rubbish strike, which she managed to leverage off. Um, Roads, rates and rubbish, they were her slogans. When she lost, Jim Sawley was lucky enough to have a rubbish issue in that Sally Ann had determined she was going to put a waste transfer station at Rochdale in one of her better seats. Uh, and the effect of that rippled around the, uh, the uh, city. But more damaging to her was that um, at that time, they only revalued land every five years, I think it was. And they did the north side of the city two years before the council election. And their rates went up significantly uh, because you levy um, rates on the basis of land valuation or total rates that you need to raise divided by land valuations in apportioned to your property uh, in proportion to the, the value of your property. So everyone on the north side had a valuation uh, leap their rates went up. Then the next year they did the south side. Well, that meant that your rates on the north side went down, but your rates on the south side went up. People were angry. Sally Ann didn't blame the state government as she should have done because they were in charge of valuations. She took it on the chin. And so she got blamed for the rate rises. That's what gave Jim Sawley his uh, majority, which he, and he only just got there. Um, and then Sawley was in fairly safely because people saw him as being a good manager. And then at the end of that, he handed over to Tim Quinn. Uh, Tim was seen as being pretty lacklustre. Uh, people weren't that happy with what was happening in the council. And Campbell came along and basically he sold himself as the energizer. 
Bunny under the slogan uh, Can Do Newman or Can Do Campbell. Um, but again, he only just fell in, showed that he could manage the place. He's cemented himself in and, and the Liberals haven't taken, you know, lost a trick since. But it's good management. It's not um, partisan politics. When you look at the federal um, seats in Brisbane, uh, we've gone from uh, having only one seat uh, back in 1983, the seat of uh, Ryan, uh, to now where we hold uh, everything but um, Griffith and Lily, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Oh, you've got um, Rankin out on the, uh, it's not really in Brisbane, it's in Logan City. Um, so, and um, oh, you've got Milton Dick. But anyway, it's, it's the majority of the, the federal seats now. Uh, that's an aberration in that, um, you know, from history that you won't hold that for more than a couple of elections and it'll flip back and it's quite capable of flipping back all the way. Um, one of the phenomena in Brisbane is that we have a lot of marginal seats and that's because we have a, a very hilly city. Um, so what happened when Brisbane was being developed was that you, if you were wealthy, differentiated yourself from your neighbours by buying a property with a view. And um, if you're in a place like Melbourne where you don't have any hills and you don't have a lot of views, you differentiated your, um, yourself from uh, uh, people not as well off from you, buying in Turak, for example. Um, so, so you bought in wealthy neighbourhoods, whereas here, much less of that happening. So again, East Brisbane, where I grew up, there were people at the top of the hill uh, who had tennis courts um, because the top of the hill had a view. The people up there had ballrooms, not where I grew up, but at the top of the hill, so you've got a mix. Uh, and that makes a lot of the seats in Brisbane marginal. So you can have small movements and things will flick heavily the other way. And that's certainly not the case in in Melbourne, as you alluded to. The, the west and the north is all uh, safe labour. The uh, the inner south and the east is safe liberal, and then the swing is in the the southeast along the yeah. the Frankston and and Pakenham areas. Uh, when the uh, the local government elections uh, were, were held, there was also two uh, state by elections. There was a recognition of uh, uh, Labor's Joanne Miller in uh, Bundaba, and also the LNP's uh, Jan Stuckey in uh, uh, Carabin and. Obviously, to you uh, need to work on your pronunciation, uh, Tim. There, are they, they're there, in that's, just, mate. That's Bundamba. Bundamba, and, and we call it Kurumban. Kurumban. They're both indigenous names, are they? Um, well, I'm sure Kurumban is. I assume Bundamba is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies, then. But uh, uh, moving on to the the, the by elections. Uh, uh, Obviously, to trigger one uh, so close to a, a state election, they were both somewhat disgruntled. These uh, uh, MPs, and they were both uh, both uh, uh, by elections were considered a test for the respective parties uh, going into the the state election. Yeah. Okay. So, in both cases, you had resignations by members of parliament who were upset with their um, respective parties. So <clears throat> Bundamba is a seat to the, well, it's Ipswich and kind of east of Ipswich. Um, and Joanne Miller was the member. Um, she had a long running feud with uh, Paul Pusasali, who was the mayor of um, Ipswich and who is uh, um, at, at Her Majesty's pleasure and up on charges. Uh, so um, basically, I think it's fairly safe to say Paul was corrupt and there was a fair bit of corruption in the Ipswich City Council uh, and Joanne was um, telling anyone who listened that there were problems. Uh, but um, there weren't that many people that listened and there were fewer people that would do anything about it. So she's been actually uh, a little bit of a one-man uh, cross-bencher uh, whilst being on the government benches. Uh, she's made some of the hits in the last uh, state parliament and ultimately she decided that she was going to uh, give it away. Um, she, in fact, in the last state election, um, she was uh, notorious for um, being seen with Pauline Hanson. Oh, yes, we all remember that. Encounter. Yeah, because Bundamba is part of the um, 
the, where the boundaries were in the seat of Oxley when Pauline won. So it's one nation heartland. Um, so she resigned. Jan Stuckey um, was the member for Currumbin. Um, she'd signalled that she wasn't recontesting this election. Um, and um, she was unhappy with the party. She voted in favour of the government's abortion bills. And I think she came under a fair bit of pressure because of that, which she described as bullying. Um, you know, I, uh, my attitude is uh, if you're in politics, uh, it's all bullying. And if you can't stand it, you shouldn't have been there in the first place. And it's certainly not an excuse for a member of parliament uh, to pull the plug. And um, you had your Julia Banks down there in Victoria and I would have said the same thing to her. Um, you know, you, you watch them in parliament and all that yelling and, and jeering, um, that's... Um, well, that's just what you see politeness. on camera. They, oh, no, they do it off camera as well. You know, there's bullying. That's what it's all about. It's war without the bullets. Um, so anyway, she pulled the plug. Um, and um, uh, so Joanne Miller wasn't happy with the person who was pre-selected, um, even though she was the ETU uh, representative, which theoretically puts her on the left of the party. She's a pretty right-wing candidate, and that's pretty right-wing traditional Labor territory. The guy they put, have put in as a genuine uh, left-winger. Uh, he's a bit of a blow-in. He grew up at Redlands, uh, even though I see from his maiden speech, which he delivered yesterday, that uh, he's of uh, Indigenous descent and uh, his um, homeland is just north of Bundamba. Uh, but anyway, he was basically a blow-in imposed on them and she wasn't happy with that and as far as I understand didn't don't campaign for him but certainly didn't campaign against him. Down in um, Currumbin um, the local member had a successor picked out. Uh, the successor was um, uh, actually um, um, not sure that he was vetted out uh, strictly speaking. They have a vetting committee that looks at the background of um, people who put their hand up for pre-selection. I think he actually withdrew. Uh, but in any event, um, uh, he was um, either vetted out or uh, uh, persuaded not to run. And um, Jan Stuckey was not happy with that. The woman who was pre-selected had put in her nomination, uh, thinking that the pre-selection wouldn't be till later and that Jan would be the, the candidate. Um, She's a lady called uh, Laura Gerber. Um, she's a litigation lawyer. Um, she lives at Eleanora, which is uh, in Palm Beach, but in the Crumman electorate. She grew up in the area and she was in fact a, uh, a clubby at the Crumman RSL, uh, RSL. She is a member of the Crumman RSL, but the Crumman Surf Life Saving Club. Um, so, you know, she's a local, been in the area, but no background in the party. Um, she got the pre-selection because there was no one else and Jan Stuckey had um, precipitated this um, uh, by-election. So she was in a sense an accidental candidate. But uh, I've read her pre-selection, uh, her uh, maiden speech and uh, I think she might be a happy accidental candidate for them. Um, so anyway, so you've got two, two electorates. The margin, the other thing I have to tell you is the margin that Joanne Miller had in Bundamba was about the third best, I think it was in the uh, state, 72% to uh, 38. So 22% margin uh, of safety there for Labor. Down in Currumbin, I think it was three and a half percent, Jan Stuckey, so it was a marginal seat. In the end, in Bundamba, they had a 10% swing against them. It might have been 12, because I think he's on about 60% two-party preferred. Now, that is not a good result for Labor. It wasn't a good result for the LNP, though. And this exemplifies what I'm saying about them not meshing with that kind of working class, lower middle class vote in regional, outer suburban areas. The Liberal Party got, from memory, about 13% of the vote there, about half of what One Nation got. One Nation were the runner up. So, in a state election, you'd expect that. You know, probably Labor will do better than the by-election, but not necessarily. And the beneficiary won't be the LNP. It'll be One Nation. Down in Currumbin, um, obviously the, the Liberal Party won. 
uh, on um, second preferences, it was about a 2.5% swing uh, against them. So they're in there just uh, 15.5%, something like that, to the Labor 495 um, You would expect Labor to go hard in the, uh, in the state elections. So it is by no means a laid down Mazir. And uh, Mrs Gerber will be on her own. Uh, so the campaign and the by-election was run by headquarters. Uh, her next campaign, she'll have to run herself. Obviously, like every other candidate, she'll get attention from headquarters. <clears throat> and obviously, um, she'll be one of the key marginal seats that they'll be putting effort into. But it'll be a different situation. Um, the other thing we should probably talk about is that um, the uh, ALP is nobbling the uh, LNP and the other minor parties at the moment. They have a bill in Parliament to limit how much you can spend in an electorate and to limit how much you can raise to spend in an electorate. Is this modelled on the Victorian legislation that it, it was is. passed uh, before our uh, 2018 state election? It is, but it, it limits more severely the amount of money uh, that you can spend. Uh, and it also potentially limits the range of third party organisations that can come in and support you. So you've got to look beyond the complexities of the, the legislation. It's sold as we can't have money buying elections. And up here, they're worried that Clive Palmer might come in and spend a lot of money and cost them seats. So that's, that's one issue. Um, but last time the caps were in, um, there was a by-election in Redcliffe uh, and the Newman government was in power. They hadn't got around to changing the legislation to remove the caps. I was shown the expenditure from that election, from that by-election. Labor Party and Liberal Party sp spent exactly the same amount of money. The LNP was outspent seven to one because on top of the uh, Labor Party expenditure, there were various unions and other mm. theoretically independent groups. That's the situation we're going back to under this legislation. So they're limiting what the state parties can spend to about $150,000. If you're an independent candidate, you can't even spend that much because you don't have a party organisation behind you. So independents are at a further disadvantage. But the LNP, because they don't have union affiliates who can all go in and spend money, they'll be at a general disadvantage. And a seat like Corumban, uh, Mrs Gerber will find herself uh, with a number of unions in there spending up to the max, which I think is 58,000. Uh, so there were hundreds of thousands spent on the by-election. Uh, there'll only be 150,000 that the LNP can spend all up uh, in Corumban. Uh, the ALP will be able to spend 150000 all up, and then you'll have any number of unions who can spend 58000 uh, on top of that. Now, you, you listeners might think 150000 uh, is a lot of money. Most of that money is actually going to be provided by the public because they're doubling the amount of public funding. Um, so we're going to be paying for this rort. Um, so... That is going to make it very difficult for the LNP in those must-win seats that the way to spend is going to be with the ALP. Whatever the ALP say is going to be with them because they have these union affiliates who will come in and do the hard work for them. And that's another factor which I haven't heard anyone talking about, but which will be a strong factor in the next election. If the LNP can't get their messaging right, they don't have a strong appeal to working class and lower middle class voters in those regional and commuter suburbs, and they don't have the firepower, they're in diabolicals. Uh, we might finish uh, our discussion by, by, by we've talked about the, the north-south uh, divide in, in Queensland. There is a, a renewed uh, northern Queensland separatist uh, push, uh, the, the Catter Party, uh, uh, they've uh, put their lot behind it and uh, uh, George Christensen and, and Matt Canavan, they're sort of flirting with that North Queensland could be uh, its own state. It's, it, sort of seemed, it, it sort of seems to me that because uh, WA secession, it's, it's always uh, been on the, on the back of the 
uh, agenda, uh, uh, something that's sort of dreamed about, but how would it actually happen? Um, yeah, my mum was born in Townsville in 1922 and grew up in Cairns. And um, she went down to Melbourne uh, probably about, I'm uh, never quite sure, but 43 or 44, towards the end of the war, to be in the WAF. And then she came up to Brisbane in the 50s and um, lived here the rest of her life. But if you got her in a mood, um, she'd often talk about you Southerners. And she wasn't so much talking about you Southerners in Victoria. She was talking about people in Brisbane. Um, so that um, I've got a bit of insight into that North Queensland instinct, uh, which is very strongly that we're on our own up here. You people don't care about us. And when there is money, it's made up here and you spend it down there. That's basically the way they look at the world. Um, and it was a, a strong uh, feeling before Federation and the Constitution allows for an additional state up there. Um, but despite them thinking that all the money's raised up there, um, they raise money, but I think they'd be struggling to uh, run themselves as a, uh, a separate state. Uh, so it's one of those issues that pops up on a regular basis. Um, but I think it's more a, a fantasy, and I think people up there know in their, um, in their water that it is a fantasy, that it's not going to happen. Um, having said that, um, as a think tank, um, uh, we can see prospects for um, secure power up there, and um, if you Victorians keep going the way you're going and uh, keep pumping all that unreliable uh, renewable, so-called renewable energy into your system. If you refuse to countenance gas, and if you refuse to countenance nuclear, uh, and if you don't invest in some pumped hydro or battery technology doesn't uh, uh, improve uh, extraordinarily quickly, uh, then there's going to be a lot of industry looking for places to go. And uh, North Queensland's got some some prospects. We've still got reasonable um, coal-fired power in uh, Australia, and uh, there's some real hydro prospects in North Queensland. Uh, there's been some talk of the uh, the Bradfield scheme, and uh, Sir Leo Hilsher, who was a, a legendary public servant here and uh, is still a legend, but uh, getting on, uh, he and Sir Frank Moore have been pushing a uh, a new version of it, and um, some parts of have actually got some legs. And they'll particularly have some legs if we can uh, put some hydropower in there. Uh, but there's other hydropower uh, possibilities without the Bradfield scheme uh, happening. So you do that. There's plenty of land up there uh, which could be used uh, for industry. There's ports uh, where you can uh, export. And um, I think one of the things that held North Queensland back in the past was the climate. And um, of course, we didn't have air conditioners. We have air conditioners now, so that gets over part of the problem. The other problem you've got in North Queensland is the weather. Um, and uh, when I say weather, I'm thinking of cyclones and, uh, and the, uh, the wet season, which often closes roads off uh, and makes industry difficult. So that's something which um, no amount of, uh, of re reliable power can, can cope with. So. Uh, I think it's still got problems, but it's also, uh, it's got opportunities and it's never really realised its uh, promise. Um, and um, perhaps in the modern world, uh, that promise is coming closer, but I think it will be realised more quickly as part of a, uh, a unified Queensland rather than a uh, Queensland that's been split into, it wouldn't be split into two, it'd be kind of split into 75, 25%. I think the uh, the pandemic has uh, reminded uh, a lot of Australians, despite a lot of uh, uh, power uh, uh, drifting to be centralised in in Canberra, the states uh, still have a a lot of power on their their own, and so I think that's uh, got a lot of people thinking about. Uh, uh, issues like should it should there be more uh, states? But thank you for giving uh, your time tonight to to Wilmsfront uh, and uh, the Unshackled. And well, if we need any 
uh, any uh, Queensland politics expertise closer to election day, we, we know where to go. I'd, I'd be, be happy to help out a colleague in the alternative media space. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.